Oh. Don't see that sight much anymore. I'm Jesse Norton. I'm Buster Norton. I grew up in the Wolf Laurel section of Madison County. Yep. Went to Epps Chapel School till seventh, uh, see, seventh grade through seventh grade. Went to Marsill uh, Elementary in the eighth grade and then Marsill High School. Went to Marsill College, went to university then. And then I worked at MicroSwitch for 20 years and taught school for 20 years. So now we're, we're supposed to be retired, but now we're farming. <laughs> That's my third life. <laughs> I hope I'm not like a cat and got nine lives. <laughs> How about you, Buster? Where'd you grow up? Uh, grew up on Arrington Branch, uh, on Madison, still in Madison County, grapevine section. We, uh, I was born in the house I live in, uh, and they're all my life still live in that house. And, uh, uh, went to Mars Hill School, graduated high school, I didn't go to college. Started work at Drexel, worked at Drexel Furniture several years, and then started full-time farming. And that's where I've been, except a few years I drove a school bus and farmed. School bus driving was just a part-time job. Now, he did carry mail, though, substitute mail carrier for several I've years. Worked, yeah, I've worked at several yeah. jobs. Paul Millen, <laughs> Brick Lane. I worked. I've laid brick for several years when I first got out of school. You might say he's a jack of all trades and a master of one. That's farming. <laughs> <laughs> As we start to talk with Buster and Jesse, a little backstory on tobacco might be helpful. There are two main things to understand, and that's allotments and the buyout. Tobacco has been grown in North Carolina for almost 300 years. But the real boom came in the 1880s when methods were developed for mass producing cigarettes. Tobacco remained the largest generator of income for North Carolina farmers until the early 2000s and the state is still the nation's largest producer of the crop. During the depression the tobacco market became flooded and prices collapsed so in 1938 the federal government began to regulate it. Tobacco production was confined to mostly the southeast and limits were placed on the number of tobacco producing farms. Price supports were set up and limits were put on the amount each farmer could grow and how much companies would pay for the product. How much could be grown on a particular farm was the allotment. The income tobacco produced helped folks pay their taxes, settle debts, and have a little left over to buy Christmas presents for their children. But times and attitudes changed and throughout the 1980s and 1990s production slowed as fewer people smoked and cheap tobacco imports flooded the American market. In 2004, both federal price supports and quotas were ended, and a buyout was introduced, providing payments to growers for 10 years, funded by the tobacco companies. The buyout was intended to provide financial help while farmers found alternative crops or new ways to make money, but there's been no easy replacement for tobacco, and many farmers either retired or have struggled financially. By the time the buyout money ran out in 2014, tobacco had all but disappeared in North Carolina. In Madison County, where Buster and Jesse live, Production dropped from about 1,400 acres in 2004 to less than 100 today. The importance of tobacco to the communities where it was produced, in economic and social terms, can't be minimized. 
In addition to the financial impact suffered from its demise, it's also meant a loss of identity for farmers. Growing tobacco both fostered a sense of community as people helped each other with their crops and provided some measure of financial security. While Buster and Jesse grow a wide variety of crops, they are among only a handful of farmers I know still growing tobacco. We're here visiting with them to see what that entails and to document this process before it totally disappears. Buster is a farmer's farmer and highly respected in the county, so as you'll see, he's the right person to ask anything you want to know about farming. So tell me a little bit about tobacco. I know it's, uh, you know, I used to see it everywhere when I would go out. It would just be every field you went by out in the county or even over in Tennessee was tobacco. And now it's rare. Well, uh, their, their regulations got really bad on tobacco and, and finally decided uh, to have a buyout so that farmers would get paid for the allotments and they called it the buyout. Farmers get paid for the allotments and, that they held. And uh, that put most people out because a lot of them were just farming to hold that allotment. Now, each farm basically had an allotment assigned to it uh, back in uh, the early days of tobacco growing. And, then, and uh, they would uh, get a price support. First it was lakerage and then it got to be poundage. And it changed down through the years, and and then uh, uh, people went. A lot of farmers went to leasing, so they could grow bigger. And a lot of people went out because they weren't able to tend. Farmers got older, and the, the generation of farming has got older, uh, evidently, down through the years. And and uh, a lot of the younger people don't want to go in tobacco growing. So uh, their availability of uh, immigrant labor then uh, in this area is just not good because there's no other crops besides this the tobacco. There's uh, not a lot of, uh, of uh, I'd say truck farming and that kind of produce uh, being grown so we've not got that immigrant labor and so it's hard to get a crop in the barn That's because it's labor intensive. So when the buyout came, a lot of people just got out, went to work on jobs and got out. Most people, within 10 years, it was trickling down real fast. In the last five or six years, there's not hardly any growers. There's just five or six growers in Madison County that uh, still operate. Why do you still do it? Well, I've got the equipment, I've got the land, and and I like to farm. and. Uh, there's not anything else that I can make that much money on an acre. How long y'all been married? Oh, 84 years. We were the bicentennial year. We got married in 76. 40. 40 hemming. Well, you better know. <laughs> <laughs> 47. 24 and 23, yep. 47. That's a long time. We might make it to 50. Yeah. Yeah, if we don't kill each other first. I think when they done the buyout too, well, a lot of your farmers were older farmers and uh, maybe they didn't want to keep farming. I don't know. But I think when they done the buyout, people were confused though. They thought that that was the end of tobacco growing. You couldn't grow it anymore. They didn't know that once they done the buyout, then you could contract with these companies like RJ Reynolds or BSC and grow whatever they would, uh, you know, give you a contract for. They didn't know that. Um, 
And so I think that's too why you have less growers. <clears throat> it's a just a way of life, I guess. I enjoy making a crop. Enjoy when I'm feeling good. I feel like getting out and working. I feel <laughs> good. But, uh, well, they call it a 13 month a year, 13 month crop because <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Kind of describe <laughs> the process of growing yeah. tobacco. Well, the process of growing starts early in the spring. We we seed the greenhouse in in March. Uh, Used to the last two weeks in March along in that uh, area according to the weather. Uh, we'll put seed in the greenhouse. I've got a uh, small greenhouse. Uh, I've got a 100 by uh, 32 greenhouse and I seed half of it. And I seed, I grow most plants for the county. Uh, I used to grow Used to have three or four greenhouses up around here, but uh, we we seed. Then in uh, uh, May, we usually in the last week in May, we usually transplant to the back end of the field. Uh, I work on the ground, of course, fix the ground, and in uh, May, first first of May, start fixing ground and getting it ready and put my fertilizer in and and. Uh, making preparations with equipment then we uh, transplant in May and rows uh, uh, four foot by 20 inch spacing in the row and then uh, we basically cultivate sometimes we cultivate once sometimes twice according to the rainfall and how fast it grows uh, in uh, rainy years it's hard to keep the weeds down because they'll It'll get ahead of the plants if you don't. We we spray with a weed uh, weed killer, but with a lot of rain, sometimes that dilutes the spray. It's you know it by late late fall, it's getting dying down. As you can see here in the field, uh, the late weeds begin to come. So, uh, but uh, then in uh, late late June, late June, first of all, because we go to topping. July. And spraying for uh, suckers in uh, late June, and I mean late July and first of August. Get that done, and in, usually in four weeks we start cutting. That's usually the last uh, week of August and through September we do the cutting, hanging in the barn. And then from six to eight weeks after that we go to stripping in the stripping room and uh, get stripped off and put in bales and sell it. That's usually in December. I know a lot of people grew enough tobacco just to pay their taxes kind of years ago, just as a cash crop. Oh yeah, it was a good, uh, most everybody in this county used to grow tobacco for uh, that uh, cash crop at the end of the year for Christmas and for taxes, because it was well, sustainable. You could work on a job and tend a half acre or, or an acre of tobacco if you had a couple of boys to help you and in the fall to put it in the barn. It wasn't too big a deal uh, because everybody already had the barns uh, because we kept the barns up down through the years. And, and you could get you could get high school boys most of the time to do hanging. You could go down to the local grocery store. There were several of them scattered around. Back in that day, there was uh, small groceries around and they'd sit around the store in the, of the evening and, and you could go pick up a couple of young guys to hang a a load or two of tobacco the evening uh, after school. But uh, that don't happen anymore though. The boys, I think, got enough money. Mom and Dad gives them enough money now and they don't need any money. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, they're afraid of the barns and most of them just don't want to man up. <laughs> uh, got a lot of boys coming along that just, they just don't, uh, don't see the need.
not a bad job if you're not friends of ours. <laughs> I don't I don't have any problem. I don't have any problem getting around in the barn. I used to. I used to when I was younger. I could put my arms on the pole here and make it leap, jump hard, put my elbows up here and hang my feet up here and then go on up. But not anymore. <laughs> She'd miss me if I was gone. So how much land do you tend? Well, <laughs> we tend about four and a half acres tobacco. We tend about 15 acres of corn and about a half acre of the sorghum and a whole lot of garden. And yeah, I put up away. eight or 10 acres of hay. So that's basically it in the farming. Of course that keeps you pretty busy. Tobacco's a pretty intense crop. We we kinda stay busy. It's you know, with the gardening and with the way the crops spread out, see we get through with one phase of one while the other's starting, so it's kinda spread out the whole season. So tell me a little bit about bringing the tobacco to the barn and kinda how that works. Oh from from when we cut it. Yeah. We when we haul we load the two tra big trailers and usually drive along the row and uh, just sometimes just one, sometimes two people will reach it to me, I load. Usually and Jesse drives the tractor just real slow and we load, load, uh, load however much we got, bring it in and, and back it in under the, under the driveway here and one person reaches it up and the others, we, two of us usually will hang. <clears throat> it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty fast. We hung what did we tell you the other evening? It took us three uh, two and a half hours to mm -hmm. hang six hundred sticks. It, he it's has, pretty quick. Usually each trailer have about three hundred and fifty to four hundred sticks on. Yeah. So when you bring it into the barn, how long do you leave it hang? Uh, four to eight weeks. We usually start. Sometimes it hangs longer than that because we don't get to, you know, get it done. But yeah, we can start after about uh, six weeks. Sometimes, sometimes you have to wait eight, according to how big the tobacco is, how big that center stem, stem. real big center stem, that has to cure out first. Uh, tell me a little bit about going to the auction or to the market to, to at the end of the year, or when you how that works. Well, we used to. Uh, we used to go to the auction. But they, they would, uh, we would strip it and put it in bales and take it and put it on the warehouse floor. The buyer, the buyer, there would be a grader put a grade on it. That was when we had the support price before the buyout. And we would, they would put a grade on that because they put it in the warehouse in rows. Put a grade on that. The buyers would then come with an auctioneer and uh, the warehouse men, of course, would come down on each side of that row of tobacco and as they, as they got to each pile, the auctioneer would call out a price and the buyers would bid with uh, uh, different hand signals, I guess, and different words they would use anywhere they, they knew what each one meant. And uh, the ticket writer would pick up the ticket and write the buyer and the price down on that ticket while they were selling the next pile and he would do all that as they sold that pile he would just he would keep he'd keep up doing that they would go down the row that's time and auction off a whole warehouse uh, full of tobacco in just a few hours I cut my own leg and cut my knee right there the axe How do you cut your knee with your back or not? Well, I, I, you she had to get in every kind of shape up there to cut that where the wind blew it down. She cut her own finger and I've got scars where she's cut my That's finger. That's okay, I got two with scars. Thank you. The doctor said, he said uh, he got through sewing my finger up and putting a steel rod down the there in it. And he said, uh, do you, when did you have a tetanus shot last? And I said, last year when I cut this finger, 
And I said, the year before when the squirrel bit me through the finger, he said, well, I guess you don't need a tetanus shot. <laughs> he said, woman, he said, I believe you need to stay away from those tobacco axes. <laughs> oh, Lord. When Kendra was, I guess she was uh, in uh, middle school, wasn't she then? No, they were uh, small younger. children. Huh? They were small children. She was probably been in what, fourth, fifth grade? No. Younger? Yes. Oh, well, younger than third grade, I guess. She played with Tyler Coach, Lockie's grandson, right? And uh, they were playing Cowboys and Indians. So they go in the house and they tell Lockie they need something to play Cowboys and Indians with. So she gives one of them a hatchet. She gives the other one a butcher knife. I think Tyler had the butcher knife. Ken Kendra had the hatchet. Yeah. And so along about supper time, they sit down to eat. Well, Tyler and Kendra are still outside playing. So Kendra runs in there and says, Dale, you need to take Tyler to the doctor. He's got it. He cut his heel. Dale said, well, let me finish eating first. No, Dale, she said. It's pouring the blood. You've got to come now. Take him to the doctor. <laughs> Tyler had tried to flip that butcher knife and stick it in the floor, you know, like they do. And he cut his heel. Hmm? Oh, he tried to flip it and put it in a tree. Throw it. And uh, it's, he cut his heel. Bad. He had to go to the emergency room and have his heel sewed up. So the doctor's questioning Lockie. How come he cut his heel with the knife? Well, I gave him the knife and the butcher knife, I mean the butcher knife and the hatchet to play with. Why are you giving two small kids, he said, that to play with? She said, well, they were plowing cowboys and Indians. They had to have something to play with. <laughs> oh, act like you love me. <laughs> it's hard to do. <laughs> Oh, that's my sore knee. Don't pack on my See? sore knee. See? Mm -mm. <laughs> Stop. Love mother knee, not that one. Stop. <laughs> Behave now. Get your picture made. He only gets you're one pulling. shot. Oh, sorry. If you're going to lean on me, you're going to have to lean less. <laughs> He's very patient in me. Uh -huh. With us old folks. On this channel, I hope to continue to honor the people, vibrant culture, and strong traditions of Appalachia. If you share my interest in the people and places I call home, be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons to learn more about this way of life.